All right. Good morning, everyone. We're letting people in. Um, today is, uh, what, February the 13th. It's the day before Valentine's Day. Uh, it's a, it's, um, if you don't have any, um, if you don't have a, a gift um, uh, for your special loved one, maybe you should go to the zoo because they have a really good gift store uh, or you can get a, a membership. Um, so uh, Rick Schwartz is our guest today. Um, and Rick, as we normally start, as we let people in, um, uh, I'd talk to you for a couple minutes and then we'll start in just a couple minutes. So um, I've been looking, admiring the, your backdrop, which is real. Some people have a fake one, but yeah, uh, yeah. I see you have kind of a very small elephant back behind your right shoulder. What's, what's the story of that one? Uh, so uh, this, uh, this is a uh, sculpture that I got in Zimbabwe. Uh, we went to Victoria Falls, my very first trip to Africa. It's uh, carved out of ironwood. I'm, I'm sort of a collector of you know, different things when I go over the country. This is a, an opium pipe that I got in Laos. And uh, just, uh, I have a whole room in storage. I get so much stuff that I just collect. I have no room to put it all, but there's a lot of things in my office, you know, sculptures from around the world. So well, you, cer you certainly have a lot of books behind your head. Yeah. Do they all have to do with animals or? Um, I, I, I have to tell you, yeah, they are, they're all animal books. I'm sort of uh, not that abreast in reading other than one thing. <laughs> so everything yeah. is animals and there's a whole other section on this wall. Very interesting. So um, again, we've got a, a couple of a couple more minutes before we start, but, um, uh, and this really should be a question for every, for everybody, but tell me the most, um, you know, you said you went to Zimbabwe, the most interesting place you've gone to um, understand animals. Oh, wow. Um, it, it might uh, have to be uh, my trips to, to, to Laos, Vietnam, Borneo, Southeast Asia. Um, you know, my, if anybody who knows me knows my passion for clouded leopards. And I have been to Asia about five times. My, my dream in life is, you know, to see a clouded leopard in the wild. And I've been unsuccessful with that. But um, there's a real dichotomy when you go over to Southeast Asia, you know, uh, people who really care for conservation and wildlife, but the vast majority don't. And a lot of the wildlife trafficking and this, in fact, the recent COVID incident, yeah, you know, sure. really is from wet markets. So I've seen those and it's really heartbreaking. The National Zoo is pretty involved with conservation. We work a lot with pangolins, which is uh, the most uh, poached animal in the world. We support a facility in Vietnam. I've been there several times. So, uh, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be able to go to those countries and see our conservation projects in action. And it's one of the things that we're most proud of is what our little zoo here in Nashville has done for global conservation. Well, we'll get into that uh, in a minute because that's really interesting. I didn't know you all did that. What is a, did you say a pangolin? Pangolin. So a pangolin is a, a, a scaly anteater. You, you should um, you should look them up. Anybody who doesn't uh, un know what they are, P A N G O L I N. It it is the most poached animal in, in the world. Um, they were in the wet market in Wuhan at one time. There was thought that that might have been the transmission from the bats. Uh, they're completely harmless, but they are used for their scales. Um, it's sort of an unusual animal. They have a hard scale on them, almost like a, a reptile, a snake. Uh, they eat termites, they eat ants. There's several species in Asia as well as Africa. And um, the Southeast Asians, uh, they're used for all sorts of cultural things, for medicinal value. The scales are made of keratin, the same thing as your fingernails. It has absolutely no medicinal value whatsoever, but they're being exterminated. The animals weigh about 12 or 15 pounds. And I can't tell you, I, I get all these reports where there's 10 and 12 tons of scales that have been confiscated. So um, I, I'm afraid that it's, uh, you know, one of the animals, one that I, that I love the most and um, it, it's doomed for extinction. Very interesting. So I'm looking it up, uh, an Indian pangolin. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, see, I've already learned something new already on this call. <laughs> All right, so Rick Schwartz is our guest uh, today, CEO, president of the Nashville Zoo. Love the zoo, love the zoo. And um, <clears throat> my, uh, my wife handed me this uh, as I was uh, getting ready to start. Um, so for her birthday, she got a, a, a full family membership or whatever it is, whatever this thing is uh, for um, the full year. So we plan on seeing you and your friends there uh, a lot. That'd be uh, great. That'd be great. Thanks. 
So, um, so uh, let me tell you that uh, Council Member uh, John Rutherford is on the call. So welcome, Council Member Rutherford. The, um, I was at the zoo over Halloween giving out candy, and I saw Councilman Rutherford with his son there. Uh, so I know he goes. And um, Council Member Courtney Johnston uh, was there also giving out candy. Uh, that's not the only reason I win. It was one of the main reasons. But um, anyway, so um, anyway, welcome, Councilman Rutherford. And we don't have up to date numbers yet on COVID. We usually give that out, but uh, we get them all. I'll go ahead and share. So, um, Rick, thank you for being our guest. Yes. Um, tell me, um, tell me a little bit about yourself. How, where are you from? Were you born in a zoo? You know, how did you, how did you get to the Nashville Zoo? Yeah, interesting story. I guess um, I am from Raleigh, North Carolina, and um, my passion has been animals, I'm pretty sure, since I was a fetus. Uh, my parents did not like animals at all, and I brought all kinds of crazy things home. Snakes, skunks, uh, raccoons, when I was 14 years old, brought a cougar home. Um, my parents got a divorce and I have three siblings and usually there's a big custody battle over kids. And there was for the other three, not as much for me because of all my animals. <laughs> yeah. I got fascinated with Great Danes at a young age. And um, uh, one day, instead of going to school, I flew to Louisville, Kentucky and bought a Great Dane and became enthralled with them. And I left home on my 15th birthday and I went to Louisville and worked at the Great Dane Kennel, learned how to train dogs and and then I met a, a gentleman who raised tigers and I got my first tiger when I was 16 years old. And uh, that's all I've ever done. I opened my own business when I was 18, uh, aquariums and uh, training dogs and that sort of thing. And I actually came to Nashville in 1989. Uh, they, they brought me here to design the original zoo in Jolton. And about six months later, they offered me the director's job and I moved. And when I came, I brought about uh, 172 animals with me. I brought tigers and leopards. I had a, a breeding farm. And um, I was never quite sure if they hired me for my talent or my animal collection to get the zoo started. But most of the animals in Jolton when we started were, was my personal collection. And I've been here now 31 years, literally half of my life I've been at the Nashville Zoo. That's, uh, that's amazing. Um, and uh, I so much appreciate your, your passion for all this. So, um, and, and we just got the number of new cases of COVID, it's 283 in Davidson County, okay. Um, so, um, tell me, um, just because I, I've been around a long, I remember the zoo being out uh, north of town, and then um, tell me a little bit about how all that worked. So, you started it um, out at, um, you know, off of 24, I guess, um, but yeah. then it moved to where it is now. So, how did all that kind of work? It was interesting. Uh, at the time, 1990, Nashville was the largest uh, metropolitan base without a zoo, and they'd gone so long without a zoo. And then all of a sudden, there was several entities. The Grassmere, where we are now, the original Grassmere property opened up as an indigenous wildlife park, Animals of Tennessee. They opened up um, 1990. We opened up as a private venture in 91 uh, at the Jolton site. And there was also another organization called Zoo Boosters who was trying to form another zoo. So all of a sudden, this great city who had no zoo, there was three sort of competing zoos. The Grassmere property, um, as it opened in 90, as I said, it was great the first couple of years, but it was just indigenous animals, you know, just animals that, that were either inhabited Tennessee or used to, you know, be, uh, bison, elk, uh, they did have cougars. It was only like nine or 10 exhibits. And they just did not sustain the attendance. So Mayor Bredesen at the time actually would never come to the Nashville Zoo because it was in Jolton. He said it shouldn't be in Cheatham County. The Nashville Zoo needed to be in Davidson County. So they closed in 1995. And he asked us to move it uh, to this site, which was, was, was really a no brainer. A little heartbreaking for me because we'd done so much work in Jolton and I really thought it was a beautiful piece of land. But this was a larger piece of land that was in, you know, Davidson proper county. And so um, it, it was the best decision we ever made. So we uh, signed the lease in 1996 with Mayor Bredesen. We opened in 1997. Uh, our first year's attendance was about 72,000. And I'm really pleased to say our attendance now has grown by over 1,700%. So pre-COVID 2019, we did 1,266,000 visitors. And we had the highest 
percentage increase of any zoo in the country. So we're really, really proud of what we're doing. And, and we sort of just see um, us just in our infancy. You know, it's the ninth largest zoo in the country by land mass. And we have so much room to expand. We truly have the capacity to build one of the best zoos, not only in, in this country, but in the world. Okay, so tell, uh, tell folks uh, if, um, how, how big is the zoo right now? Yeah. How many different types of animals do we have? Yes. Yeah, so um, and um, like staff, how many people work there? That type of thing. How, how big is it? Yeah, so we're, we're 188 acres. And again, that's the ninth largest zoo in the country. But the advantage of it is like most of the other zoos are, are pretty much built out. The advantage of us being a really young zoo is we have so much room to expand on pretty much raw land instead of having a lot of antiquated exhibits, which all, most all zoos do except for the Nashville Zoo. So that, that's a real luxury for us. Right now we have about 200 employees. We're down about 40 employees due to COVID. Um, it was very difficult for us to do. Unfortunately, we had to, you know, to, to lay some people off, which was for me personally difficult. I, I never had to do that before. Uh, so we struggled with that. Um, no animal keepers were laid off, uh, which were fortunate. A lot of zoos across the country. Um, some of the senior keepers were, were let go, offered early retirement, trying to reduce the, the budget. So we're fortunate in the, in the fact that we had the financial stability that we, we did not have to do that. So I'm very pleased with that. We have about 4,000 animals here. You know, it's, it's a little misleading because you know, we count every animal, fish, uh, you know, reptiles and all that. We have some species of reptiles where we have, you know, 200 of, of one species. Um, so, all right. So I usually save a lot of the really good questions for the end, but this one <laughs> was, um, <clears throat> why is our zoo different? You know, compared to other, uh, I know that you've said that we have the ability to expand, which is, yeah. um, which I think yeah. is important. But, you know, um, I, I love the National Zoo, love the way it's set up um, and all the things about it. You know, why is our, why is our zoo different or, you know, I'd like to say better than, than many of the other ones out there? Yeah. Um... Well, that's a great question. And I am really proud because I do feel that our zoo is different. Um, you know, as a zoo designer, I, I've, I've been fortunate enough to, to go all over the world and see exhibits. And you often see the same exhibit. In other words, a tiger exhibit looks the same at every single one of these exhibits. And we're sort of committed to doing things different. And, and as you said, we, we want to build the absolute best exhibits that we we can. So when we decide what species we're going to exhibit, the real focus is on, first of all, we want to work with endangered species. And the perfect example is our Andean bear exhibit. Um, a lot of zoos go with grizzly bears and black bears, certainly. And, and while they're certainly charismatic, there's no real conservation value to those species. And most of them, most of the, the, the grizzly bears in the United States come from orphans in, in uh, Alaska, right? But, and they would be either, uh, most of the cases they're neutered, you know, or spayed, so they don't produce them. But we feel if we're gonna dedicate the money, the time, the space, we wanna do so with endangered species, animals that really need that conservation work. So the bear exhibit, uh, it's the, one of the rarest bears in the world. It's the only South American bear. So we also want to bring a cultural element to the zoo, and we're so we're committed to authenticity. Authenticity. So uh, it's called immersion exhibitry. When you come to the Andean Bear Exhibit, you feel like you have been immersed into a Peruvian village. And I went to Peru uh, several times to do research, and um, it, it's as authentic as it possibly can be. Uh, so we're trying to do it. The animals, quite honestly, are the easiest part, but we're trying to do it with architecture, with landscaping, with food, culture, all of those sort of things. And then the level of detail that we put into this um, is really due to a personal neuroses that I have. You know, uh, We want it to be the most detailed uh, of any exhibits. And, that, and that's really where it is. When you go to like our tiger exhibit, for instance, um, you know, it, it represents Sumatra. And so, I, again, was fortunate enough to go to Southeast Asia and we went and we took photograph references and we recreated, it's called Batak architecture style. It looks just as it would in Sumatra. So people are sort of immersed in that and they take notice of that. Um, I don't know anybody, any zoo who's willing to put this level of detail. In fact, 
the president of Walt Disney World visited me and I was very honored uh, that uh, Meg Crofton was here. And she said, this is more detail than Disney puts into their work. So um, I don't know that everyone picks up on that detail, but I think it's just a, an overall ambience when you're in those places. And, um, and, and then we're getting ready to expand again to do some of the most aggressive work that we've ever done. So I think, that, I think that's what makes it different. Also, it's not just that we have one species, for instance, um, a rhinoceros. It's not that we have rhinoceros, it's certainly rare, but we want the, the most genetically valuable animals so we can in fact breed them. So I brought four rhinoceros in from South Africa. They're unrelated to anything in the United States. So there's a real focus for us to breed endangered species and, and to contribute to that, the population. Cool, cool, that's interesting. Um, tell me, uh, well, so um, I was gonna add one thing to it. So I didn't know that you could do this. <clears throat> But the, the time that we went and got uh, the membership this year, we also did one of those backstage tours yes. with the flamingos. Right. Um, and so tell people about that because uh, we did it with the flamingos. That was very, very interesting. And uh, tell us about it and I'll tell you our experience about it. Well, so I think that again is a little bit different for our zoo. I mean, you can go to the zoo and it's a wonderful experience, but there's nothing like getting up close with the animals, really close with the animals and be able to interact with the keepers. So we have a whole variety of um, different opportunities so you can get close to the animals. The backstage pass is, is, is really amazing. Um, there's as much going on behind the scenes as there is in front of the scenes. So you can get a backstage pass and, and you can go see our, the largest collection of giant anteaters, which, which are fascinating. You can see the flamingos. Now we have a group of flamingos where we walk them through the zoo every day and that's gonna expand. All, we just built a new building to accommodate lots of different species that um, we can take along the, the paths and people can interact with. We're working now with TWA, uh, really soon you can be able to go back and meet our rhinoceros and be able to touch a rhinoceros. So that's gonna be a, a great facility. Um, so it, it's just, uh, it's, I think it's a better way uh, to educate our guests by focusing on one particular species and been able to interact with them and to touch them and talk to the keepers. So I encourage you to go online and look at our backstage pass. It's really fascinating. Uh, it makes a great experience. People come here just for the backstage pass. And, and that's gonna expand. As we grow into our African exhibit, those opportunities are, are gonna multiply uh, intensely. Um, so uh, my daughter's on and she just sent a message through and asked about um, conservation efforts. Mm. Um, is, and the question is, um, and then I'll, I'll go back to the flamingos in just a minute, because that's who we did. But the, the question is, and you've been talking about conservation, is there, a, um, is there an effort by the zoos across this country to focus more on efforts to, uh, for efforts on conservation, protect animals? Yes. And, and I love, um, um, and maybe you can head in this direction, because I didn't know that you all did stuff around the world in terms of protecting animals. So tell us how all that's working. So, so that's, that's a great question, uh, Jim. Um, it's not enough for zoos anymore just to be a zoo, to be a recreational facility, to hold animals, and, and quite honestly, even breed animals, endangered species. Um, it's really our obligation uh, to, to be the leaders in the global field of conservation. So um, AZA, the Association of Zoos and Aquarium, which is the accrediting body of, of zoos, there's about 224 zoos in the country. Um, may, it's been about maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, they didn't mandate that, but they're encouraging zoos to put a minimum of 3% of their operating budget towards what's called in situ conservation, conservation in the range country of these animals. And we contribute um, almost double that. And, and we feel strongly about that. I'm, I'm not sure, we've done a better job, but I don't think just like you, Jim, I, we, I don't think we've done a great job of articulating just how much work the Nashville does in countries all over the world. So that, that's one of our passions. Um, that's, that's one of the detriments um, in the world, quite honestly, due to COVID. Zoos have taken a particular hit uh, with COVID and we, and we can get into that a little more. But we are involved, um, as I said, in Vietnam, in Thailand, in Laos, in Borneo, in Sumatra, in Russia, uh, about six different countries in, in Africa, Central America. We actually started a, a breeding project 
uh, in Iquitos, Peru, in the Peruvian Amazon, where we um, work with the government there on confiscated animals. As I was talking about the illegal trade earlier, these animals get confiscated. The one thing that really got me, and, and this, this talks a little to our zoo, is we're protecting species that will never exhibit. The pangolins will never have them. They don't do well in captivity. So if you come here, you don't, you don't see them. We started a program in the Pantanal, which is in Brazil, the largest wetlands in the world, for a giant armadillo. You've seen the armadillos that run around here. Usually you see them upside down on the side of the road sunning themselves, right? And they're about, about nine pounds, 10 pounds. This is a true dinosaur. It's a hundred pound armadillo. There's none of them in captivity. And, and we started this pro project and a lot of zoos have now contributed. We work with giant anteaters also in the Pantanal and the Sahado in, uh, in Brazil, uh, trying to um, improve ways to keep them alive. Most, the biggest threat is highways, right? They get run over. So uh, we've developed collars that we put reflective collars so truckers and, and you know, motorists can see them and pleased to say none of those animals have been been killed. So we're working with that. Um, in, in the Quitos, Peru, uh, when I went there the first time, we, we got enthralled, I got enthralled with, with manatees. Um, they kill the mothers to eat the mothers and then the villagers raise the babies to um, as pets until Christmas time. And, and then they kill the baby for Christmas, which is a big deal and it's horrifying. So we worked out deals um, where we, we confiscate those babies, the government confiscate those babies. But more than that, we go into the villages and the Amazon villages. And, and if you don't kill manatees, we have organized dentists and all kinds of doctors to go into the village to provide care for them, teach them better ways to, to raise food. So it's not always about the animal, it's really about the indigenous people. If we can help them better their lives, that will in fact save wildlife. So it's one of the things that, that I'm most proud of. We've won uh, five international conservation awards for the work that we've done with other partners around the world. So you'll see more and more of that. Uh, we're gonna focus on that. And, and our obligation is to really educate our guests that come in, not of course what we're doing, but also what they can do in fact to help wildlife and conservation. Why would, um, why do, um, what's the thing with the manatees? Why would they, I, I, under, I understand the food part of it if that's what they needed, but why would you raise the babies and then kill them on Christmas? They don't, they don't have, this is one thing that I've found uh, throughout the world, um, and again in Southeast Asia, it, it, there's a complete lack of empathy for animals. So the babies um, are fun for the kids to play with, but there's not enough meat for them really to eat. So if they raise it up all year, that, that those animals grow so fast and, and a manatee will fill feed the whole village, right? So, yeah. um, and they keep them in small cages in the river. It's, it's incredibly cruel. And so what we're doing is rehabilitating them and then uh, we will release them back into the wild in uh, protected reserves. So um, it, it's just unbelievable. Um, there's a market in Aikido, so you can go there every single day and there's literally thousands of animals, uh, manatee meat, uh, turtle eggs, uh, you know, dead turtles, uh, jaguars, almost anything and everything you can see, which is completely illegal, but it's right there in the public. And then there's no refrigeration. So at the end of the day, they just dump it in the river and the next day it starts all over again. So um, COVID was, when, when COVID hit, they actually demolished the market, mm -hmm. which I thought was a great thing, but unfortunately now um, it's, it's back. So, um, they, these local villagers, but, but because they have no means, you know, they just really go into the forest and they're denuding of, of all wildlife. It's, it's a really big um, issue. It's called bushmeat, basically. So they eat almost anything that they can find to sustain themselves. Yeah. Tell me, um, I love elephants uh, and um, I worry, <clears throat> I worry about elephants in this world and, um, um, it seems like everything I've read, elephants <clears throat> are very um, family oriented. They are, um, they're very emotional. They're very sensitive. Yes. Um, what's going on to protect elephants? And I, I think I heard this, we don't have any elephants at the National Zoo, at least right now. Is that right? 
That, that's correct. Um, we, we actually decided to get rid of our elephants and, um, you know, we're going to be designing, we are designing right now, a 40 acre exhibit for Africa. And it was a big decision. Should we have elephants or, or should we not have elephants? And, and we decided not to have elephants. The biggest reason is they're, they're very difficult to find. Um, and the only way we could bring them in would be to import you know, a group of animals from the wild. And we just did not feel that would go well. I personally feel that would have been a mistake. You're gonna to have to separate family groups, all the things you just mentioned. So um, there's a couple zoos that do elephants well. Um, the San Diego Zoo is having great success with breeding. The Lowry Park Zoo is having great success with breeding, but the, the vast majority don't. So I, I think in the future, you'll see uh, fewer and fewer zoos having elephants. And the ones that are doing it, you know, are gonna concentrate and, and do it really, really well. Um, as far as elephants in the wild, again, COVID has had a devastating effect on global conservation because all of the African reserves that rely on ecotourism, um, that tourism supports conservation efforts, uh, protection units for elephants and rhinos and others. And all these lodges are now out of business and the rangers are, you know, can't be paid. So poaching has gone up astronomically. There's some populations in Botswana, actually the elephant population is doing so well, that represents a problem, you know? So they, oftentimes they have to relocate elephants and they try to do that with, with family groups. But um, yes, I mean, th their populations and rhino populations have declined dramatically, um, you know, over the last 50 years, over the last 10 years, even over the last five years. So um, they're in trouble. If, if I were, um, <clears throat> or if anybody watching were interested in conservation efforts, is there information at the zoo? You know, is there places that you can learn about how to get involved and other things like that? Or where would you direct somebody? To the, there is, I mean, there's a lot of organizations and that's, you know, we've been really fortunate because there, there are people now that are recognizing how much that the Nashville does for conservation. And, and last year we received our largest um, conservation donations restricted towards conservation. You know, the, the Melkis Foundation gave us $100,000, which was, was great. And, and we're involved with so much. So yeah, we, we would welcome anybody who's truly interested in conservation, you know, to call us and, and call me personally. And I would love to talk with them. Uh, one of the, pro I'm on the board of a, uh, organization called Grace, which is Gorilla Rehabilitation and Conservation Education. It works with a species called Grower's Gorilla, which no one has ever heard of. It's the largest species of gorilla. There's none of those also in captivity. But the problem is uh, on the black market, a baby gorilla is worth a million dollars. And in order to get the gorilla, most times they have to kill the entire troop to get this baby. And then they use the, the adults for bushmeat, as we spoke of earlier. So um, for someone like me, I mean, it's just heartbreaking. So we have 13 gorillas at the facility, but when you look at it, if you have 13 gorillas that were orphans, you know, the chances are, you know, that's 40 or 50 or 60 gorillas that were killed in order to get those. And, and our goal now is with these gorillas as they're maturing, we're working with the, the Congolese Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, to reintroduce these animals into Virunga National Park. And, and for someone like me, to be able to reintroduce a, a population of animals that had such a horrific start in life is, is a great success. So um, yes, there's lots of opportunities and, and there's certainly national organizations, you know, they get involved with. So sure. one of the things I think we're gonna do better, you know, graphically and in, in our programming is really to teach people how to get involved and encourage everyone to get involved with some form of conservation. And it doesn't have to be in the Congo or South America, there's so much in Tennessee, even in, in Nashville, that they can do. There, you know, uh, one of the things we're really proud of, we've been involved with the Nashville crayfish, right? Which is an endangered species here in Nashville. And um, we're, we're fortunate, you know, we have, we've had them on our property and our tributary. So it's one of the few organizations that actually manages an indigenous endangered species on our own property. And uh, we've been working with them since we've been here for 20 years. And the fish and wildlife now is, is looking to delist them as endangered species, which again, is another huge success. Good, good. All right, so tell me, um, you talked about COVID overall, and you were talking about particularly tourists going over. The impact on the zoo, and two things. One is the impact 
on the animals themselves, and right. then two on the on the zoo overall. Um, you know, how is COVID impacting both of those things? Yeah, so zoos were hit particularly hard with with COVID um, when we were obviously forced to close like everyone else in, in March. Unfortunately, that's our, our peak month. So we were closed March, April, May, we opened in June. We do about 45% of our business during that peak season, our spring break season. So for financially for us, um, quite honestly, it was, it was very difficult. We did have to, to lay people off. Um, but, you know, like, like the museums or the symphony or something like that, while it was hard on everybody, and everybody closed, those organizations, you know, can close their doors and turn off the lights and all of that. A zoo obviously can't do that. We still have to feed our animals and, and nothing on that aspect changed. So our costs really didn't go down dramatically short of, you know, the layoffs. As far as the animals are concerned, there really wasn't an impact on the animals from COVID because we provided them the same care that we do each and every day. The, the one thing that was interesting to me, <laughs> you talk about an impact was our tiger exhibit. When people stopped coming to the zoo, our female tiger, Frances, started developing stereotypical behaviors where she would start pacing when she never had done that before. And, and, and I didn't attribute it to anything. And then one day we were doing work, a bunch of keepers were doing work inside the building and she came up to the glass and laid down close to the people. And so we started doing some more work by bringing more employees over. As crazy as it sounds, and I never would have thought that, she actually missed people. And so when we reopened, she stopped that behavior. So um, I, I never would have bet on that at all. But, but short of that, that you know, the animals um, weren't affected at all by COVID. Now we were particularly cautious because I think you may have heard, you know, the Bronx Zoo was the first zoo that, that found COVID in their tiger population. Right. And then uh, several months ago, uh, six weeks ago, the Knoxville Zoo experienced that. And then the San Diego Zoo, which was really concerning, started seeing it in their gorilla population and proved that, you know, their, their gorilla population had COVID, which was the most concerning, you know, probably the rarest of all the animals, the most similar, obviously, to humans. But so far, all of those animals um, have, have done well and, and gotten through it. And uh, to, to my knowledge, not a single zoo animal has died due to COVID. So um, I was gonna ask you how, do you, how do you treat, how do you treat an animal with COVID? Well, so, so really it was the same sort of thing that a human's doing. And it's not really a treatment. They had symptoms from it. So there was no real treatment for them. You just sort of uh, make sure that they're hydrated enough and, and everyone has, has gotten through it. You know, in the case of, of the tigers and even the gorillas, you know, the same type things you would see in humans, respiratory infections and things like that. Um, they would go off diet a little bit, but almost the same two week process, they would get through it. And um, no one to my knowledge, again, has any lingering effects from it. So, right. so we've, been really, we've been really fortunate with that. Now, that's not the case. That's a zoo animals. Uh, mink seem to be particularly susceptible to it. And a lot of the mink ranchers and farmers have been devastated by it. I mean, it, it, it has a tendency to kill mink. Um, so for, for whatever reason. I, I heard about the minks. Yeah. And I heard there was a, the, the story about they had buried like thousands of these things and they, but they didn't bury them deep enough. And then they started rising. Uh, it wasn't rising from the dead. It was rising from the grave, but they were calling them zombie mings. Did you ever hear that story? Yeah, but what would they, they didn't bury them deep enough and was really um, saturation of the soil when it, you know, they got heavy rains and saturation of the soil. So, all right. Yeah. I, all right, I, so they my weren't... knowledge is no such thing as zombie mink. All right. So <laughs> the, the, the minks weren't walking around dead and walking around. Okay. So that's good. All right. So tell me a little bit, particularly because of COVID, um, the most pressing needs of the zoo um, I know it was difficult. Obviously, it's been difficult for everybody. Um, and um, the zoo was struggling like everybody else. But most pressing needs at this point um, right now, obviously, we're hoping at some point to get through this thing. Sure. But most pressing needs right now. Well, s certainly finances. I mean, um, you know, since 2009, uh, you know, we have we've operated, you know, with a operating surplus that goes back into capital improvements or conservation or whatever that would be. And this year, you know, um, we had a, a 2019 rather, we had about a 200, 
I'm sorry, $2.8 million loss. And that's really hard. And it's going to be difficult for us to make that up, if not impossible. You know, we've, we've applied for the second round of, of PPP, but, you know, we're certainly not in the financial shape that we were before. But having said that, we're in much better shape than a lot of the zoos around the country. Um, we have a really good board of directors, a smart board of directors. We have developed an endowment. We didn't have to tap into the endowment. We did uh, operate with surpluses from 2018. Uh, those are all exhausted now. So we're hoping uh, that this year is a better year. Um, we rallied sort of strong towards the end, actually, um, of last year. We actually met our budget in October and November. I think that was mostly due to weather. So, you know, it, it, if it doesn't improve over this spring break, then we can be in, in serious trouble. Having said that, you know, in 2019, when we had a record year and those numbers kept looking to climb and with the expansions, one of our biggest concerns is, is parking because we were unable to accommodate our crowds in 2019. So COVID is going to be over soon. I strongly believe that the vaccine's out there. So I think things will come back to normal. And then when they do, uh, the zoos become so popular, we literally cannot uh, accommodate the crowd. So we're going to have to develop additional parking space. And we've used all of our contiguous space. So that's their only option now is, is to build a parking garage, which we've designed. So that's going, that's going to be one of our biggest needs, you know, post COVID. All right. So you're talking about, uh, obviously, just dealing with COVID and the zoo itself. What's the, what's the biggest challenge, not necessarily COVID, but the biggest challenge in operating a zoo, what, what is, what would you say as the CEO is the biggest challenge of actually operating something this large? Well, um, I, I think it comes down to finances again. You know, I mean, we're one of the, the few zoos in the country that, that don't get municipal support. So I think we have to be a little more entrepreneurial in our approach. And we're trying to um, always, always better the zoo. We're pretty, pretty new, but again, we started things 20 years ago. So a lot of that stuff is starting to break down. So we're doing a lot of remodeling and things like that. Uh, we're trying to generate more funds, quite honestly, to be able to pour, to be able to put that back into our staff. You know better than anyone, Jim. You know Nashville has become a very expensive uh, city to live in. So we're trying to uh, do things for for our staff. Um, when you talk about um, difficult things, you know, the exhibits that we do are, are really difficult, but I don't see that, well, I may see it as a challenge, I see it as such an opportunity. Um, we have such an incredible amount of room to grow on. This next exhibit we're going to build, a 40-acre exhibit, um, this is, you know, it's a state-of-the-art exhibit. I, I would say it is going to be one of the best exhibits in the country and perhaps the world. But it has a big price tag, you know. It's uh, it's going to be two hundred million dollars plus. So that's going to be hard to generate that. So uh, yeah. in order for us to be a world class zoo, um, how do how do we attract that much um, finances? Um, that's a challenge for us. I got it. Uh, a couple of questions came in. Um, there was a question about the St. Louis Zoo, which is having some financial trouble. Do you know anything about that? I think there was a question about that. The St. Louis Zoo. Well, the St. The St. Louis is a state-run zoo, right? And it's one of the, the the remaining. There's only three free zoos in the country, and I think, as you know, man, you know, every every municipality, every state, right, is having huge financial difficulties. So it's a result of that. They, they rely heavily um, on state funding, which which has been reduced um, for obvious reasons. Okay. Um, another question about mass mandates. Um, are you having trouble? So I've been to the zoo several times. Uh, looks like everybody's complying. Are you haven't had any trouble with people not complying? Um, we have. Um, uh, you know, the park is such a, a big park and spread out. Uh, for the most part, um, and I would say even more recently, when, when the mandates first came out, I think we had a little more trouble with compliance. But I think recently now it's not been so much trouble. We, we staff around the heavy congested areas like an exhibit and we request people wear masks. Um, early on, it was, it was a bit of a problem, but I, I'm pretty proud of people now when they come in. We, we don't have as much of a problem. I, I think also when it was summer, you know, when it was really hot outside in August and stuff, that's when we had a problem. So that may 
hopefully it's, you know, we get through and get this summer, it won't be such an issue. Okay. All right. So here's a couple of questions that have come in that came in over the week. So it's kind of a, just a combination of different things. All right. So um, the women's restroom, mm. there are uh, exhibits in, I know in the men's room, uh, but there was a question about the women's restroom. Apparently there are some things in the women's restroom that the men can't see because they're only in the women's restroom. And I assume it may be vice versa with the men's. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> what is, what is going on over there? And um, are you going to eventually have to go to like, I don't know. I don't even want to get into it about restrooms <laughs> so people can see what's uh, what is in the other restrooms. Yeah, this, this is always uh, sort of comical to me. Um, I had this idea uh, in 2016 when we built the entrance that it would be, it would be great. Um, and, and this goes back to what's a little bit unique about the Nashville Zoo. Um, we decided that our restroom should be beautiful, right? That we should put just as much detail in the restrooms as we do an animal exhibit. And then I thought, how cool would it be to put exhibits in the restroom? So we, we, they came up with the idea kind of late in the, in the design process. There wasn't a lot of room and space. And I came up with um, putting snakes, putting pythons over the urinals. And they thought it would be fun. And we got the exact reaction that we thought. I mean, we would have, we would have little boys coming out, you know, saying their moms, moms, there's snakes in there, there's live snakes in there. And they wouldn't believe them. And I would venture to say there's been more women in our men's restroom than maybe anywhere else uh, in the city. Uh, so if there's no visitors in there, the husbands or sons will, will drag their, their wives or sisters in there to see the snakes over the urinals. We've also had grown men come running out of the restroom, you know, not, not particularly as impressed with that idea as I was. But um, for the most part, it, it just did a lot of conversation. So it worked so well. Uh, we had the opportunity in the bear exhibit uh, to do something much more grandiose. And so... Uh, we decided to put um, endangered cotton top tamarins in that restroom. It's a, one of the most highly endangered primates in the world. We provided them a really nice exhibit. So there are cotton top tamarins only in the women's restroom. It was a space limitation. Um, and one of the things I'm really proud of is that restroom won uh, last year, I believe, the top restroom design in the country over hotels and restaurants in New York, Vegas, L.A., we were super, super proud of that, got a lot of attention. But there, are, there have been a couple of complaints from men. Oddly enough, not one single woman has complained about not seeing the pythons over the urinals. But a couple of men have complained about not seeing the cotton top tamarins. And, I, you know, we thought that might be a concern. You know, since we opened that, there's been about 2.8 million visitors that have visited. And I think we've had 17 or 18 complaints. And there was, there was one man that was truly angry because he wanted to see him. Turned out it was his favorite animal. And so uh, he, he wrote to me, I said, hey, if you really want to see him, we close at five o'clock, I'll meet you at five o'clock and take you in to see him. And he came and, and I showed him the animals and he was really appreciative. But the point being is it's been so successful, we'll have about three more major restroom facilities as we expand the Nashville Zoo. And we're going to get crazy with the restroom design. So there will be some situations where the men will see one thing and the women will see one thing. And I think that's OK, because it, it, it induces conversation with families, which was exactly the point. And then the African restroom, we're doing a huge restroom uh, exhibit in the restroom where both the men and women would be able to see the exact same exhibit. And, um, and, and what's happened, you say what's what's unique about the Nashville Zoo. I think what's unique about the Nashville Zoo, in addition to what I said earlier, is that people are copying and emulating what we're doing. So you're seeing a lot more zoos now that are having exhibits in the restrooms and, and it stems from what we did sort of just to have some fun. You know, I'm uh, based upon this, I'm thinking about putting a python in my bathroom. I so that I can. <laughs> I, I, I absolutely will. I absolutely will. You know. Um, okay. Um, interesting. Um, tell me. Uh, there was also a question about, uh, and I talked to um, actually talked to the Adventure Science Center about this as well. Nashville, very diverse, very uh, uh, lots of different cultures. How do you encourage people who may not necessarily speak English to come? And are there signage? Is there 
is there signage in Spanish or other languages? And will there be at some point so we make everybody feel comfortable about coming to the zoo? So, so it's, it's a great question. Um, we, um, uh, we did develop a map, uh, a Spanish map. And so now we're, we're getting away from that and doing more digital. This last two weeks, we've been working on developing an app. There's a company called Blip. And um, they really sought out and chose the Nashville Zoo because of the innovation. We should have that up and running uh, by summer. It'll be an app. You just scan the code. And not only will it be, um, you, you'll download the map, but at every one of the exhibits, um, you'll be able to see and interact with either virtual uh, keepers or actual keepers. Um, it'll be actually in a multitude of languages. Uh, it also will tie us into the conservation projects that we're doing. It's completely innovative. It's uh, that while there's some zoo apps now, this is by far going to be the best zoo app that, that I had ever seen. You know, Disney has one as, as well, but um, I think it's going to be a whole new way of learning about the zoo. We spent a lot of money, to be honest with you, on, on graphics and we've won a lot of awards for graphics. But if you really sit back, unless it's an interactive type graphic where kids can punch a button or see video, the static graphics are sort of a thing of the past. Um, people don't like to spend time, you know, reading graphics and, and that sort of thing. So uh, now you'll be able to get on your phone and just, it'll, it'll run by GPS. So wherever you are in the zoo, it'll come up. We'll talk about that animal. You can insert questions, questions will come back to you. It can link you to our conservation projects around the world. And I don't know, um, to your original question, Jim, I don't know how many languages that, that we're gonna initially start with, but the language portion is, is really easy. So it will be, because Nashville is so diverse, you'll be able to come and hear this in a multitude of languages and be much more interactive with the zoo. I think it's completely innovative and something I'm really excited about. And I'm glad that uh, Nashville Zoo was chosen to be uh, the pilot program for this. That's, that's great. That's really good to hear. Let me ask you this, and this may be pre-COVID, but um, do you all um, do outreach? I know that you can do it to schools, but particularly, I mean, you're right down the street from Plaza Mariachi. You know, are there efforts to um, engage the city as a whole? Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We've, we've always done outreach, even since our origin in Jolton. And we have people that are just dedicated to that. COVID obviously stopped that. But in preparation for expanding this program, um, last year we opened up a brand new facility just for animals, uh, for the outreach program. And then what I mentioned earlier for uh, the sort of encounters along the trail. So yeah, it's not just schools. We hit a lot of schools, but we also go to corporations, um, you know, it's sort of spreading our word of, you know, what we're doing. So that, that's one way I think we do a great job uh, of sort of expanding what we're doing for conservation. It gives us a platform to do that. So that's just going to expand and expand as we go. Um, I'm still thinking about those pythons in the bathroom. I'm, the, the next time I talk to the mayor, I'm going to suggest that we do that at City Hall and, and see what he says. I'll, I'll let you know. It'll be fun. Um, let me switch to something that was sad. Um, um, the giraffe. Uh, um, tell us a little bit about that. You know, I know people were watching. It was a it was a big deal. I know um, one of the news stations had like a live, you know, like live coverage. Yeah. But what, what, what happened? What happened with that? So it was, um, it was really unfortunate. And, and one, one of the, the saddest days here at the zoo, there's always a chance and a risk uh, with first time moms of any species, but particularly some of the larger species um, that things don't necessarily go well. It's, and and it, it ends up being a learning opportunity for the mother. In this particular case, uh, the pregnancy was going uh, very well, um, no problems. Um, we knew about when the calf was due. And so we started watching them 24 hours a day. We had staff, you know, keep an eye on her. And um, the vets noticed that she was dilating, but showing no signs of labor. Uh, when, when these animals get that big, you know, that's a big, big calf, you know, over a hundred pounds. Um, it's really hard. Well, usually you'll see movement in things and, and we weren't seeing any movement uh, because of the mass of the animal is so big, it's really hard to penetrate through ultrasound. So the vets were concerned that the calf actually 
uh, had died uh, within the uterus, which is again, not uncommon, but very problematic. So um, she, she was dilated and the vets decided that we needed for the health of the mom, assuming quite honestly that the calf was dead, that we would pull the calf. And uh, so we have uh, sort of like a, a device where the animals can go into it and we can squeeze them in. They're trained in there every day. They're very comfortable in that area. But pulling an animal of that size, you know, uh, from a female is, um, is difficult. We actually have to put, um, you know, like uh, chains or something on, on the feet. We would go in with the feet and then we use come alongs to pull it out. It's, a, it's quite a process. The mother did amazing. She was eating while we were doing that. She didn't seem to be in any sort of distress or pain. And staff was upset. They felt the calf was dead, but they were concerned about the mom. So the vets went in and pulled the calf. It went remarkably easily because I've seen others that don't go that easily. Um, quite honestly, and sometimes it's, it's called a phototomy. They actually have to cut the baby in pieces and pull it out in pieces, you know, from the mom, which is a horrible experience. But this one, great, the, the calf came out and much to our surprise, it was healthy, it was full term, it was alive, it was actually doing really, really well. So my staff went through a, you know, really dark time thinking the calf was dead, worried about the mom, because oftentimes the mothers die through that process, to having a perfectly healthy calf. And it was perfectly healthy. So we pulled the calf, uh, the vets, you know, did, a, did an exam on it, make sure it was doing well. But the mother was distressed by being separated from the calf. So we wanted to reintroduce the calf to calm the mom. We reintroduced the calf to the mom. She was doing really well with it. You know the whole process when you know the calves can stand up within 20 or 30 minutes. The calf was trying to stand up. The mother was trying to help it by using her hoof to get it up and accidentally pressed on it too hard. And she pressed on the neck and, uh, and, and sort of killed it um, almost instantly. So the, I felt bad for my staff because of the, the dichotomy of emotions that took place sure. in that short period of time. Um, the mom, you know, uh, was a little stressed for about two days and then she was perfectly normal and the male was showing interest in again. So, you know, we anticipate um, that she may already be pregnant again. That's sort of a safeguard in the wild, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of mothers lose their babies in the wild and they can come back into estrus pretty soon in order to breed again. So we think she'll have another calf, um, you know, in 16 months. And so, um, and we think obviously she will have learned a lesson. Uh, we'll certainly watch her, but, you know, it happens with first time moms, but um, fortunately the, the mother is great and uh, staff have come to terms with it, but it, it was one of the saddest days we've had here for sure. Well, I'm I'm glad um, glad the mom is doing okay. I was I, I knew the the story about the baby, and then I was worried about the mom, and I hadn't heard much more about it. And it sounds like, you know, yeah, she it's, she's doing good, and we're excited. Um, we're going to be adding to the giraffe herd. Uh, Disney is going to send two young females, so that'll give us four females, which we're really excited about. Okay, all right. So um, I think we have time for one last question. Um, and that is, um, so you've been with the zoo for all these years. <laughs> the most interesting story that you can tell us <clears throat> about the zoo. Um, you know, I always worry that, you know, somebody's gonna stay in the zoo at night or whatever. But what's the most interesting story you can tell us about all your years at the zoo? Oh my gosh, you, there's not enough time for that. Um... Uh, let me see. Well, we actually did have someone stay at the night. Remember that guy that used to go to all these places and he was, you know, um, I'm not the most uh, uh, social media type person, but he was broadcast. He was in the zoo all, all night long. So that was, uh, that was something. <laughs> what, was he, I, I what, was he, what was he doing in there? Everything. He, he went, he went into the jungle gym, the playground, he was walking all over, he had the zoo and um, it was, it was unbelievable. But um uh, I would say maybe one of the most interesting days here, um, we had a board meeting and uh, we've been really fortunate where we haven't had a lot of escapes, but during the board meeting, uh, we had a cheetah escape. And so we still had the board meeting, but we had to close the zoo. I didn't go to the board meeting. I spent most of my days, most of the day chasing that cheetah. Um, 
you know, obviously we have a fenced in enclosure uh, and they really are fast. You hear it, you know, how fast they are. I can tell you, I was chasing it for about eight hours, uh, but um, the SWAT team came with helicopters, which was the worst thing because it made it so much worse. The SWAT team uh, came, they were up on the top of a trailer and they all had their guns. And when they would see the animal, I said, please do not shoot this animal. He's not dangerous. He's fine. I will get him. And uh, we were able to finally tranquilize him and got him back safely. But it was an interesting day. And, and the, the worst part of it is I had, I had so many chigger bites. I, I went to the hospital for three days from chigger bites. <laughs> it, was a, it was not a good day. But, well, interesting, but, and I'm glad that the cheetah was okay. <laughs> Got back. Yeah, to yeah. There's about a hundred stories I could tell you if you have time. Well, so I'm going to end because we're almost out of time um, by telling you the flamingo story. Uh, my wife okay. and I went. Uh, we we saw the when we walked into the zoo. We we had bought the tickets to do the backstage thing. All the flamingos were sitting right. There. They were all standing there right at the front. And they were uh, eating. It was um, is it uh, shrill? It's the Krill, krill. Krill. Okay. Yeah, krill. So they were eating, people were walking around. And so we talked to the staff who were great. And then we walked the flamingos back to kind of back behind where they, you know, their, their back area. And uh, we sat there and we talked about um, the flamingos and then we got to feed them. And they were, um, they were hysterical. They were all just walking yeah. around us. And uh, then they started kind of uh, nipping at our coats. I think one of them took my wallet. I'm not sure, Rick, but I'm I, still checking I, on that. I trained them to do that. Yeah, yeah. I understand. <laughs> no wonder I know the zoo's budget is tight. <laughs> so, uh, but it was really a remarkable thing. And I really would encourage people to sign up and do that. It really was great. And besides the flamingos, I know leopard, a baby leopard, is that right? Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of leopards, you know, so we're, we're the leader in breeding them uh, uh, all over the world. So we're really proud of that. And just uh, one thing, if I could, um, what we're working on now is a 40 acre immersive African exhibit. So the real goal, I, I've been fortunate enough to go to Africa about seven times. The first time I went, it changed my life, but the vast majority of the public will never have the opportunity to go on a safari or, or to see Africa. So, you know, I think we have the capability to do one of the best exhibits. So we're gonna build this exhibit 40 acres, which is larger than most zoos in their entirety. And you're gonna be able to, to go to a lodge and uh, you're gonna to tour this exhibit on a boat ride, very similar to the Okavanga Delta in Botswana. We'll use the water moats as barriers. You won't see any caging or anything like that. You'll see, we'll more than double the collection size. So you go on this boat and you'll see these animals, underwater viewing of hippos. It's really, really uh, exciting and it's gonna propel the Nashville Zoo among the best zoos in the world. So I, I really think the Nashville community is gonna be so proud of, of what we do, um, hopefully to date and what we do in the future. Very exciting. So um, last question, if people wanna volunteer at the zoo, if they wanna learn more about the backstage tours, if they wanna donate, what's the best way to do that? Um, it, it, you can get to any of those functions online. So just go to nationalzoo.org. Um, volunteering right now is still a little off because of COVID, right? So we're still limiting that, but um, yeah, just, um, you know, I think our website's really good. You can navigate anything through those channels on our website. And um, a disability playground? Somebody just asked a last question about that. So we're doing that right now. We're, we're doing a modification to the jungle gym. We're, we're dramatically improving that. But uh, we are working with FISB and NOAA Foundation, and we are doing uh, about a $2 million addition uh, for a playground for children with disabilities. But it's an all-inclusive playground, you know, so it's, it's encouraging everyone to come. It's something that we're really, really proud of, and uh, it's going to open up mid-April. So it's, um, it's a great addition to the zoo. Great. Rick, thank you so much for your time. I would thank encourage you, everybody to... Uh, look at the website and then go visit the zoo. Um, thank you for what you do. This is great. Um, again, I appreciate the time. The next week, it's my understanding that we're going to have uh, Dr. Battle from the school board. Uh, and so um, join us next week for that. Everybody stay safe. Rick, stay safe. Keep those Thanks. animals safe. And yeah. we'll see you soon. Thanks, All right. Thanks everybody. Appreciate have a good rest of the weekend.